Facebook fam. Uh, welcome to another episode of Community Voices. Uh, you've got Michael, creative director of JD and Finish Line. Uh, I'm tagging in for Omar and Cass to talk about the recent increase in violence directed towards the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Um, I'm excited though. With me, we got West Coast's own Yay Area staple, Rocky Rivera, musician, hey. author, journalist, organizer, voice of the street. Uh, and of course, uh, the mother to uh, two beautiful children. Um, so let's just get into it. So thanks for joining thank, us. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to sit down with you. Absolutely. Um, so how has the rise in uh, racial motivated violence against uh, the AAPI community affected you? Well, it's affected me in multiple ways because I've been having to have conversations online within my own community and really just reminding folks that um, violence against Asian Americans, violence against um, folks that are disenfranchised is nothing new. Um, when we see uh, marginalized communities victimizing each other, um, which is what happened earlier this month, um, with a lot of the people that were uh, the perpetrators against these Asian elders, I, I felt um, conflicted because a lot of them were the same age of some of the youth that I've mentored in Oakland. And every time one of these things happens, I always hope that it's not one of my youth that has become a perpetrator to these events because I feel a connection to Oakland as a former youth organizer. So um, really in the beginning of the conversation, it was really reminding people not to be divisive about what's happening because as a journalist, I understand that an increase in the reporting of crimes does not necessarily mean an increase of crime. And because of my journalistic background, I was able to be very objective and not reactionary. But what I did see within the Asian community was that a lot of the handles that I followed, a lot of the uh, nationalistic or Asian social media was uh, not having the kind of conversation that I was wishing that they were having. They were really, it was really becoming an anti-Black conversation and it was becoming a dog whistle for um, things like, well, where's BLM now? Why are you doing this? Where's And so it, I, I needed to really make sure that we knew that the rise in Asian American violence starts at the top with the conversations and the words that President Trump has said at the beginning of the pandemic. And we saw we see this happen during every pandemic, right? The African swine flu, the, you know, every single Ebola, right? Everything. There's always a racial tinge to how pandemics happen. So the conversations I started to have were about um, reminding people that there's violence that happens to us every day. And there's violence that happens to Asian American women every day. But when it becomes a national conversation where the former president is not condemning certain rhetoric, then we know that that violence is coming from the top and the violence is systemic. This is nothing new. We're just starting to see it in a different way. Yeah, so I mean, as grown-ups and old heads, we know we know this, right? Like, how do we talk to our kids about that? Like, how do you talk to your kids? Well, luckily, my son lives in Oakland, and he has a, a diverse friend group, and he knows that a lot of the media plays on stereotypes, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I have conversations with him about his place as an Asian-American, in Oakland, we have a lot of talk about privilege. We have a lot of talk about the ways that he's treated versus some of his classmates or the way he's treated versus um, some of his other female classmates. And so we, we, it's an ongoing conversation. So when we talk about what's happening in the news um, and he's afraid for my safety or, he, or he's afraid for the safety of his grandparents, um, I let him know that um, safety is something that has to be built continuously. It's not something that comes from the police and it never has. The police have never been able to protect uh, communities of color that are in low income neighborhoods. Um, and so that's how gangs started. That's how gangs started in LA. That's how Southeast Asian gangs started in Oakland. That's how gangs started in, in San Francisco is that we learn to protect our own. Now, when you take that gang mentality and change it to an organizing mentality, then 
people really know who the enemy is. And that is not each other. We are not the enemy, especially folks that are from low income communities. We need to understand that the violence that happens every day is systemic. And, and when I talk to my son about it, I'm grateful that he lives in Oakland, which has a legacy of black and Asian solidarity. It has a legacy of fighting against the real enemy, which is capitalism in this sense, where everybody's suffering right now. Those Asian elders, they're suffering and they've been suffering because they are disenfranchised. And when it happens in Chinatown, when it happens in San Francisco, it's because people in those communities never felt protected by the police. So I don't want people to think police is gonna help us. That's not the, that's not the answer. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, we, we started this series um, last year, about, about this time last year um because of those uh racial injustices that were happening and i you know i want to take a second to say their names after george and brianna and ahmad and tony and dion and so many others before and after them it, it was it was important that we we elevated the voice of the black community to be able to like speak up on mm -hmm. them um and it wasn't something new it wasn't something like that was going to change overnight but it was something that we wanted to elevate so you know what role has the the blm movement played in supporting the elevation of uh aapi voices I mean, it's hard because I stand on the shoulders of Black activists. I stand on the legacy of solidarity. So BLM didn't start Asian American solidarity of Black folks, you know. For me, I come from San Francisco State University, which was uh, the first place that had the College of Ethnic Studies. And it was created by the Third World Liberation Front in 1968, where the term Asian American was created to build solidarity between Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. And those Asian Americans knew that we needed Black studies. We needed um, Latinx studies. We needed Asian American studies. Because if we don't have that, then we don't understand the long histories of violence that we both all share because of imperialism and colonization. And that affects us. So unless you have a history of the organizing that came before you, then you won't have an understanding of where things have already been done and things uh, People have already laid the groundwork for this. So when BLM came around, I was excited because it gave younger folks, namely my former students, namely Gen Z, a way to reinvigorate the conversation about civil rights. Because let's be real, the ways in which the civil rights movement um, really lo looked at respectability politics and really um, venerated um, you know, men in the movement and actually made idols out of people that were easier to kill for the, from the FBI. BLM learned from that. BLM learned that they would never make it if they just had one person on a pedestal. BLM was founded by women, black women. And that to me was the biggest impact because that showed me that the legacy of civil rights, the legacy of social justice continues and that we're learning. We're learning how to move and mobilize. And when, when you talk about them uplifting AAPI voices, how I learned to be an organizer is how I is how I learned from the Panthers. I learned their 10 point program. I learned that when people rush the Capitol and they have no demands, they're not about nothing. So unless you know what you're about, you're not about nothing. And that's what I learned from the black community. So when I see young Asian Americans standing up and even checking me sometimes, like sometimes I'll be like, hey, you can't repost this because this has the N word in it. And I'm a journalist. So I'm like, I don't want to censor nobody. I want to repost this. And they're like, no, no, Miss Rocky, <laughs> you can't do that. To me, I'm instead of being like, oh, damn, young one, I'm like, I'm proud. I'm proud that young folks feel encouraged to um, come to somebody that they might think is like a, a, a role model, an icon or whatever, and check me with love and be like, no, this is not what we're doing right now. And so that's what BLM has given the AAPI community is the ability to progress, the ability to learn, and the ability to look at ourselves and say, solidarity is what you build it's not what you have it's not a product it's not something that, that's an easy fix it's something that we build continuously yeah yeah for sure you know let's let's uh let's touch on the music a bit because you know the the black influence in in our culture has been been heavy and, and paying that back like understanding like reading learning 
all of that has is you know is a big thank you and, and a big like you know it, it's respect right so yeah uh, and and as you start uh you know creating art and and, and words for for this generation like as an asian american as a filipino as a as a so-called mi model minority how do you bring that real culture to life in your music right well look at me i don't do i look like a model minority do i sound like a model minority i think i think that's the conversation that's happening right now is how are asians like me mm -hmm. um not benefiting from that stereotype um and i think that when i step on that stage people are confused they don't know they don't know what they're looking at at first because they're not used to seeing asian american rappers much less asian american women so when i step up um and i and, and at times you know i when i first started i wanted to hide that you know that's why my name is rocky rivera right you don't know if it's a female mc you don't know what race they are they might be puerto rican they might be filipino there's a lot of riveras in the world you know and but the real ones know that that name came from jessica hagedorn's book gangster of love who also wrote um dog eaters and that i stand on um a history of ethnic studies so when i come to the mic i'm not just talking about myself as an asian woman uh, mimicking what black people do i'm talking about living in the same community working in the same community being from the same community and being disenfranchised from the same communities like them so that we can be in solidarity and i think that's what people don't understand is that growing up in san francisco growing up in oakland black folks and asian folks we're like this we're like this and oh. we need to remain that way because we are both affected by white supremacy and we're both affected by gun violence and guess what depending on who the perpetrator is we we don't, we don't get justice either so we need to really understand that as asian americans that it's a class issue it's not a race issue right right yeah so i mean solidarity was is a big word right so a reminder to ourselves that it's brothers sisters in arms on this it's, it's well let me talk about the music i know i skipped right over that part oh, you know I, you know what i'm excited because i've been making this music for 10 years yeah. right and when i've had to take up space as an asian american woman on on those stages on those bills where i'm the only woman or if i'm five two okay so i gotta come correct i gotta i gotta step in that place and take my place so um you know the fierceness the energy the defensiveness of wanting to defend my community wanting to hold it down to show a a real representation of what asian american women can sound like and and rap like you know i was able to really um exemplify something that other young women who did not fit the model minority mold gravitated to and i understood that there were young girls like me that wanted to see more of that and so 10 years later we're having this conversation i'm freaking happy that people are catching up i'm amazed i've been here we've been here but what i was able to bank on was that i created uh, more space for MCs like me simply by being myself. And when things like this happen, people want to look back and see, is it authentic? Is it real? Does it speak a story that people can relate to? And you know what? Hip hop is my culture. It's my medium. It's the culture that I adopted when I left my hometown, when my, uh, I left my homeland. And I wrote about that in multiple songs about how hip hop became the culture that adopted me when I lost my own. And, and that is the same for many immigrant children, no matter where you go, is that hip hop became our universal language. And I just learned how to master it because I love the culture. So it allowed for me to uh, create a platform, but I would never have been able to do this without uh, saying that it all goes back to black culture. Hip hop right. is black culture. And when I say that out loud, people feel uh, relieved because they don't have to ask me. I, I'm telling you, hip hop came from black culture and that's real. So 
as an Asian American woman, I need to say that because yeah. um, a lot of the things that hip hop has done for me is still not getting his dues. You know what I mean? So I still need to let hip hop know too. I, I got you, you know? Yeah. yeah. First love, you know? Um, help me out. How can we, um, how can we give some people tips and uh, allies, people just learning about um, the AAPI community? Like, how can they help? Well, I would say, um, I know people want to open their wallets and that's helpful. Um, and I know what, I know people want to go out there and, and do something and that's great. What I'm asking people to do is learn, not just listen and learn, but don't be afraid to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's all a part of the process and for other people to let people make mistakes because that's how you become a better ally. Um, I think a lot of the divisiveness in the left community or in the organizer community is that we're trying to one up each other's wokeness. Yeah. And it's annoying. It's annoying because wokeness is related to privilege and education. And so for me, I want to make sure that when I come into a space, I'm not talking down to you. I'm not um, telling you what you don't know because I came from a background that is not privileged. And I had to learn how to be around folks without learning the history. So now that I am an adult, I can see that there is so there are so many books out there. There are so like, first of all, learn about Grace Lee Boggs who was an organizer out in Detroit. Read up on Yuri Kochiyama, if you haven't already read up on Yuri Kochiyama. Make sure that you read Angela Davis. Make sure that you um, basically understand that there is a groundwork for us and that we are part of a movement. We are not the movement. So the best thing you can do is to study up is to study up and learn so that we don't have to repeat the same mistakes that they made and so that we can be more effective organizers. And the number one thing is as an organizer is that you've got to meet people where they're at. You can never meet people where you want them to be because you're going to turn them off to the movement. And we need every single person to understand they have a place, they have a skill to lend, they have a story to share, that there's space for everybody. So you know, hopefully people will learn that um, this is a process, right? It's not yeah. a destination. Yeah. And, and I want people to forgive themselves, forgive each other, um, as long as the intention is to be a better ally and as long as the t intention is to learn, um, then I think that's a good first step right there. Yeah, yeah, and continuing that movement, right? So. Um, the, the future is, is going to continue that for us. So, so talk to me about um, Oakland's Kids First. Yeah, Oakland Kids First is an organization that um, when I first moved to Oakland, I became a part of. And, you know, you see how beautiful Oakland is when you learn Oakland from the west to the deep east, all the way on 98th. And every day that I drove to those campuses and organized those young people, um, around culture and around trying to get cops off of campus, um, I had to really advocate for the most vulnerable people, which is black and brown kids in public school systems. Mm -hmm. And what I learned is that people don't know solidarity unless you show solidarity. People don't know respect unless you show respect. And the ways in which young black and brown kids have been disrespected left and right, they are, they open up to adult allies that really look at them as culture changers to know that you have the potential to change because I was one of those brown kids in public school, look at me. And, and so when I came into Oakland Kids First, not only did I understand the power of culture change as um, moving the needle forward, but that policy change is just the beginning. You can change the policy and the culture will remain the same. Look at women's rights, right? We passed, we passed that policy, but we're still not getting that. So what I learned is that I learned restorative justice, which is really important in building community. I learned to advocate for the most disadvantaged people. And I learned that the youth 
have the power to make changes. They just were able to pass a resolution to let 16 and 17 year olds vote on the Board of Education at OUSD. And that's all thanks to organizing. So when I think about my, um, when I think about myself as an organizer and the 20 plus years I've been organizing, I really saw um, the beauty of that with Oakland Kids First because I was able to graduate a cohort. I was able to spend time in the deep east. I was able to spend time in the west where there's black and brown kids. And then when I got to the, 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 uh, the schools that had more Asian kids than black kids, I was able to bring that experience to them and show them the privilege that they had. So I'm excited. Um, about the future because of organizations like this who have been uh, building solidarity and that are investing in the future. Because we know the future is really where all of our work will live. And I wanna make sure that they know how to inherit it and how we're able to pass it down intentionally. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely amazing. And you know, I, with that, thank you for um, kind of shining a light on that, on that group and um, that work and that message. And, you know, on, on behalf of uh, JD and Finish Line, uh, we'd like to donate $20,000 um, to continue that work and that message to Oakland's Kids First. You know, the, the monetary value, but also the, you know, just representing it and, and um, you know, giving these kids a chance to be able to do that. So um, thank you again. Thank you. I'm really excited. That's so amazing. This work is really important and they do rely on donations and grants that are hard to come by. So I think they would really appreciate it. And especially the youth in Oakland who are really fighting for reparations for black students right yeah. now. And that's so important. That's going to go a long way. So thank you so much to all of you at Finish Line. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, with that, um, hopefully we'll uh, we'll talk soon um, to all the uh, viewers and subscribers out there. Make sure to follow Rocky on Instagram and Patreon. Uh, make sure to cop that book, Snakeskin, uh, authored by the one and only. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for chatting with me on this important topic. I appreciate y'all. Yeah, absolutely.